I am Paul DeBarth, and you are listening to Gospel Tangents with Rick Bennett. 185 years ago this week was the terrible Hans Mill Massacre. 17 Mormon men and boys were killed in that terrible atrocity. In our next conversation with Paul DeBarth, an archaeologist from the Community of Christ, he'll discuss his new book, Hans Mill's Hamlet, and talk about some of the things that he's found there archaeologically that changed the history uh, that we know about Hans Mill. You know, he's actually done a lot of work in Nauvoo as well, and in part one, we're going to first dig into the history of Nauvoo. So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. Welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm excited to have a longtime friend of mine, but you probably haven't met him before. Um, could you go ahead and tell us who you are and where we are? Good evening. I am Paul DeBarth. I am uh, in the in the what is this place called? It's an air. It's in, Hotel. It's in the it's in the airport at uh, Fredericksburg, Texas. And in the hotel room, and Rick Bennett is conducting an interview. And why are you in Texas? John Whitmer Historical Association has set its conference here for this weekend, and I have had the privilege of uh, being invited to to give a presentation. Yes. So, uh, the, the good thing about, or the, it's kind of a good and bad thing about this. So, me and Paul are actually going to be speaking against each other. <laughs> so I can't, I can't watch his presentation. He can't watch mine. And so I'm taking this opportunity because you're probably, actually, we're going to talk more than you're just, you're probably going to just have to talk for 20 or 30 minutes in your presentation. Cool. We're going to get the full inside scoop. I thought, I brought an hour, so we'll see what we get. <laughs> All right. Oh, you have the whole hour. Okay. Um, wow, that's awesome. I don't know if I get the whole hour or not. I, oh. But I'm prepared. You've prepared either way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've just written a brand new book. Uh, why don't you show it to the camera and uh, we'll see, uh, we'll let people know what it is. A little <clears throat> higher. What's it called? Hans Mill's Hamlet, an archaeological, uh, phase three archaeological investigation. Michael S. Riggs and myself are the, are the authors and it's published by John Whitmer Books. Oh, that's so, so fantastic! So <clears throat> it is the second. <clears throat> it's the second in a series of archaeology history, uh, and we anticipate that series will build indefinitely, because there's an awful lot of need for history to be counterbalanced by archaeological facts. Right. I probably get in trouble with this, but archaeologists with with artifacts that tell the truth often contradict what the historians have to say. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> but if we can help the, correct, the historians correct a few things, then we clearly can benefit from each other because clearly as an archaeologist, if I can get the benefit of historical uh, guidelines to know where to dig, since digging is such a painstaking operation mm -hmm. and so deliberate, then it's good to, to know where to dig, and the historians can sometimes just help with that. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about your background before we dive into the book. So you have an archaeology background. Tell us where you went to school and how you got that. I, I, I as a lad, I like to read the National Geographic, and I like to read the Book of Mormon, and I recognized that there was just an awful lot of, of uh, archaeological sites that I wanted to explore in my life, Mexico in particular. And I had the privilege of, in 1971, of getting on the Robert T. Bray Archaeological Field School from the University of Missouri at Columbia. And that uh, project was at Nauvoo, Illinois. So you're a Missouri Tiger, is that right? No, I, well, I have credits from there, but uh, my, my, uh, my undergraduate degree at Graceland College, and then I went to KU for, in Lawrence for my, uh, for my master's in anthropology with a specialty in archaeology. A Jayhawk. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Okay. However, I would acknowledge that when I go to homecoming, it's at Graceland. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, this weekend, uh, Kansas is playing BYU. Uh, at this point of this recording, we don't know who won that game. Well, but uh, who are you rooting for? Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> of course, yeah. I live in Kansas, and it's a little tough to be proud of Kansas. I mean, it's the only state with its biggest city across the state line. It's the only state that has that has fictional person that is its most famous citizen. Two of them, actually, and one of them isn't even a human. Who's that? 
Dorothy and Toto. Oh, that's right. <laughs> and, you know, it's a little tough. I mean, I've been having to teach kids in Kansas for a long time, trying to help be proud of being from a place that everybody else is trying to get away from. <laughs> I mean, if you can get, get over to Colorado, get in the mountains, that's a lot, of, a lot more appealing. And so uh, Kansas has some difficulties that way to, to be able to accommodate its history and, and uh, move that toward a, a respectable future. I mean, after all, Kansas has a terrorist statue in the state capitol. A terrorist statue? John Brown. Oh, that's right. <laughs> John Brown's Rebellion. <laughs> So, yeah, it's a little bit fun. I mean, in Kansas, the Ball of Twine is one of our most famous uh, tourist <laughs> <laughs> destinations. <laughs> Big Bertha is another one. <laughs> well, now you live, because you, you live in right outside Kansas City, right? I live in Overland Park, Kansas. Overland Park, Kansas, which is fairly close to Independence. It's about a 40-minute drive for me to go see relatives who live in Independence. So you're almost in, you know, the, all my Community of Christ friends joke that that's the land of Zion. So you're, you're practically in Zion, right? Because you, you wouldn't call Kansas Zion? Better than that. Gee, I, I had the privilege of uh, marrying an angel. And so I, I've lived most of my life pretty close to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. We're going to talk about her. Tell us her name really quick. Teporotu Rina Favora de Barth. Most people know her as Rina. Rina, right. Yeah. Uh, she, she and I have had, uh, for me, a glorious 52 and a half years together, married, and another year and a half dating. Uh -huh. She uh, has moved to the other side as of February 28th, and, and I miss her dreadfully. Yeah, I miss her too. I'm, I'm happy that I at least got to meet her. Last year, uh, we went, uh, Steve Pineacre and I came to, to see you in Nauvoo, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we went to, I remember we went to lunch with Rena and, and got to see her, and I'm so sad she's not here. Oh, so am I. On the other hand, she is because she left Tahiti but brought a lot of it with her. Mm -hmm. She has left us but taken a lot of us with her. And the, the impact that she left in our world is so amazingly profound for a little lady that fundamentally wanted to love her own family and, and not bother anybody. Mm -hmm. But instead, she helped change the world. Yeah, she's she's a fantastic lady. Um, so one of the things that I think is really interesting, um, and I kind of want to talk a little bit about Nauvoo before we move on to Hans Mill. Um, so last summer, uh, Steve and I came out to uh, to Nauvoo, and you were doing an archaeological dig. And uh, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, about what, what we were doing last summer? Okay, last summer was work, we were working, and this summer as well on the times and seasons, the second. Times and Seasons site. It's a fascinating study because in Mormon history there are several different uh, LDS printing sites. Uh, first in Independence with with uh, with um, what's his name the the uh, WW Phelps. WW. I kept thinking of probably P. Pratt and that wasn't right. Yeah, WW Phelps uh, had the printing office in Independence and it got destroyed. In 1833, um, they about that time started a printing office in Kirtland, and that one got burned, and so that one <clears throat> also needs to be explored. Then uh, Oliver Cowdery took a printing press to Far West. That one uh, got buried under a haystack when the, at the end of the Mormon War, and. Hiram, Hiram Clark went back to in the spring of 1839 to dig it out of the ground and bring it back to Nauvoo, and that's the one that was used then in the Times and Seasons. We have Don Carlos Smith and Ebenezer Robinson setting up the Times and Seasons in a warehouse that had water coursing across it, and apparently it was close to the river, and apparently on the north side of Nauvoo. And they both got sick there and I think developed a real dread for basements. But then in 39, they moved to the second site, which is the one that we're excavating. It had a basement that was deteriorated, and so they did some rehabilitation work on the, on the basement, and then they built a structure on top of it and, and was able to use part of that uh, for housing, but the main floor was fundamentally for printing the Times and Seasons and the Book of Mormon. And therefore, it becomes quite significant in the LDS history. 
Uh, the third one was moved across the street, and the fourth one is the one that's been restored on Main Street that uh, was after Joseph Smith passed. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't know that there were actually four times in season's buildings, not just one. Yeah, and so to be able to retrace the, the whole of LDS printing would be my desire. I'd like to encourage people to, to, to look to the days when we could actually have the investigations of these other chapters. But we've been working on this fourth chapter on the second times of the Caesars building. And it's just fascinating because there are two foundations there. And when Bob Bray and I worked there in 1975, we thought that we had the original the first times of the Seasons because we had printer's type. I think we came up with 572 pieces of printer's wow. type that were associated with both foundations. So therefore, both buildings are times of the Seasons, right? Well, but <clears throat> I've gone back to work on it to, to try to clean it up and make it so that we could restore the building. And I'm convinced now that the first times of the seasons, according to Ebenezer Robinson's record the, in the return, is north of Nauvoo and has not been covered by the river when it uh, rose 20 feet. Oh. And so this is the second one. And they rehabilitated this, this generation-old basement that had been put together by a, a fur trader. I think it had been used as a storage, for, a storage site for furs. And then they built a building on top of it and used that for the times of the seasons. And through the knot holes, you see clusters of type gathered underneath. In the cracks, out the doorways, here are t pieces of type. And so I'm confident that what we found in the basement and associated with both foundations simply fell through from the second structure. So the basement probably is, well, definitely is pre-Mormon, but the uh, structure that they built on top of was the second times and seasons. And we have ample evidence for that now. Well, that's awesome. So, you know, the big question for me, I believe it was in 1832 when W.W. W. Phelps printed uh, Free People of Color, um, basically welcoming blacks to the state, Missouri being a slave state, they weren't fans of that article. <laughs> <laughs> and so they uh, pied the type, as they would say, um, which I guess you know, basically they threw out all the type uh, to, to destroy the printing press. So my question is, is which building, which of the four buildings <laughs> did that okay. happen to? Okay, well, but in you're talking about the, the Phelps printing office in Independence, which would have... Oh, I'm getting which, that mixed which, up with Nauvoo, aren't I? Yeah, which, which, uh, yeah they, they destroyed the press, destroyed the type. That press went to, to St. Joe and ultimately to Colorado. Yeah. But uh, the, the press that was brought by uh, Oliver Cowdery to the far west is the one that was dug up by Hiram Clark, taken to Nauvoo, to become the press for the Times and Seasons. So it was only used for the two editions of the Elder's Journal at far west. That's all I'm aware of anyway. Oh, okay. So it wouldn't be I'm a whole lot of type from stories, there. stories, aren't I? Yeah, it's, but yeah, that's why I'm, I would like very much for us to be able to write the whole volume <laughs> of the LDS printing, but really all we have right now is the, the archaeology for one chapter. Okay, okay. Well, cool. One of the other things that I think is amazing and really cool that you do is you allow students to dig there and then you help them with, uh, with their archaeological finds. And I know you've taught, uh, tell us where you've taught, because I know you've taught both college and high school. I've spent most of my career teaching in Shawnee Mission School District in Kansas, that's high school, and I initiated an archaeology program in high school. Actually, I, I did my student teaching there in anthropology and in sociology. It's a forward-looking district, or was at the time, and uh, it was really quite an honor to, to do my student teaching there. They unfortunately fired the gentleman I did my student teaching under and hired me in his place. And I stayed there for thir uh, 37 years um, and started the archaeology program. And having archaeology for high school kids was a bit uh, of innovation, but I, I, found, I, I found that kids do so much better in learning if they get their hands into it. Right. We and if you get, get dirty. their hands dirty, right? Yeah, the hands-on hands -on history is the best way. Well, for example, I learned that if I could get my students to, to play the role of some person in, in history, they would learn everything they, they could learn about that person in history, and then we'd have a conference with all the dialogue of dignitaries, and they'd have a chance to ask questions to each other, yell at each other, and you get Henry VIII and three of his wives in the same room, and you could have some fascinating discussions. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I would do press conferences too, as I usually begin as, as Socrates, and spend uh, an hour 
haranguing them with questions uh, about uh, Sof uh, Sophia, uh, Philo Sophia, of course. And it was, it was just so much fun for me to be able to encourage people to dig into the real issues, dig into the questions, and put on the clothes, wear, wear the costume, try to get the sense of what that person's uh, life was like, and then see how it interacted with the others. And when the students did that, and so often they found it a challenge, but when they did that, it gave them a benchmark of learning that when I encounter them now, 20 and 30 years later, they still remember having done the press conference as, as uh, oh, well, it could have been, it would have been someone out of the, out of the Renaissance probably, mm -hmm. or later uh, I had students do the same process with 19th century history and so, you know, whatever, I tried to keep the girls with the ladies and, the, and that was more difficult. Uh, because uh, our history has done so such an unfair job treating women, right. but uh, to be able to, to wow, just amazing how the girls would dress up in the costumes and come representing um, Elizabeth, uh, Catherine the Great, uh, uh, Mary Queen of Scots, you know, all these yeah. various and sundry women, and uh, well, the costuming and getting into character became a, a lot of fun. So then, when I got the archaeology started, to be able to get the kids to go to the archaeological site and dig and find artifacts, that really began to open their eyes. And it was great for me, too, because you see a kid find a piece of ceramic. Mr. DeBarth, look what I found. Yeah. What kind is, is that? Is that hand painted or is that transfer printed or how did they get that decoration on there? And uh, you start them asking those questions and try to find out, well, look, uh, you got two different colors on there. How'd that happen? Oh, that's hand painted. Oh, wow! And you see the brush strokes. <laughs> Had to be able to to appreciate that's somebody's individual effort to make those brush strokes to to paint that flower. Yeah. <laughs> and what does that date to? Oh, that's a Mormon period. It goes back to 1840s. Eight. Wow! And so the student gets excited about history because they found it. And I. I, I kept track of the grades on, on a bunch of my sophomores through three years of, of high school, mm -hmm. and the ones that found artifacts, and that was almost everybody who went to the dig, <laughs> the ones that found artifacts did one grade point better in the rest of their social studies than those that didn't go. Oh, wow. So, Paul, I have to tell you, uh, back in April, <clears throat> following World Conference and in Independence, uh, we had a celebration of, of Rena's life. And I ran into one of your students. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. And I was like, so how do you know Paul DeBarth? And he said, oh, he was my teacher. And I'm trying to remember, but if I recall correctly, I think when he got married, he asked you to perform the ceremony. That'd be Nate, Nate Johnson. Okay, that's who it was then. <laughs> A rascal. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> A rascal. <laughs> Yeah, well, he he had a, a a synthetic glob of snot that he threw up and it stuck on the on the side of my classroom, you didn't tell and me it, that. it was there for years. <laughs> <laughs> well, all I remember that night <laughs> was you were one of his favorite teachers, and and, uh, and that's why he was there. Uh, I was honored that he would come ask me for for assistance in in tying the the wedding knot. Furthermore, when he and his wife, after 10 years, finally had a baby girl, yeah. they invited us, although they're not religiously affiliated with all my knowledge, said. but uh, they invited us to come bless that baby. Oh, wow. And my daughter and I had that privilege. Oh, that's fantastic. On, uh, they, they live in St. Saint, Saint Joe. Okay. And yeah, so I'm pleased you got to meet one of my former students that, <laughs> that had something good to say. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing but good. It was great. It was fantastic. So. And it was funny because I was like, so. Are you here with World Conference? And he didn't know anything about it. <laughs> yeah, he, I just know Paul. So. Yeah, you know, he he came to celebrate Rena. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we had that. <clears throat> we had that third celebration of her life. Uh, she had died on February 28th. We'd had a week of of hospice, so the kids had a chance to put together three celebrations of her life. Mm -hmm. and the first one was on Zoom, and because she had grown up speaking Tahitian and got punished for speaking to Haitian when she went to the French school, mm -hmm. then came to the United States to go to college at Graceland, majored in Spanish, 
Oh, really? And afterwards picked up Chinese, Arabic, and Russian and wow. other languages as she had opportunity as an English and second language person. She just loved being able to communicate with people on the face-to-face level. Her father had told her when he left, when she left Tahiti when she was 16 and a half, daughter, love the people of Zion. She took that literally. And she would explain that you don't know who the people of Zion are, but God does. So that means you need to try to learn something from everyone you meet. Because they're all probably people of Zion. And in the process she met me. And I received the greatest blessing of life. On that first uh, Zoom celebration, we had people from Europe, from Africa, from all across Polynesia, from all across, all across the Americas, wanting to express their appreciation because she had touched their lives. And I'll be happy to get into that, but uh, you wanted me to talk about archaeology. All right. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, I just wanted to give people kind of your background in archaeology, and you're such a wonderful teacher, and, and I think that's great. Now you asked about background in archaeology. I have done a little bit of work in Mexico, a little bit in Polynesia, but my career has fundamentally been in Nauvoo, Illinois, where I worked with Bob Bray initially. I worked with him from 1975 to 1984, uh, working on the University of Missouri contract for the RLDS church. And then in uh, 2012, I went back and with Locke Mackay and Bob Smith, we organized I Dig Nauvoo, and uh, we got interrupted by COVID. But it, was, it proved to be such a fascinating experience because we had people who were Community of Christ, people who were LDS, people who were restorationists. We had local people. We had regional people. Everybody interested in the history of where we were working, some of them just simply had archaeology on their bucket list but everybody wanted to come and work and and we would eat together and we learned we had to be a little bit careful about talking about religion and politics <laughs> but uh, well w when we got to the the uh, Battle of Nauvoo site I had people working together whose ancestors had been opponents on that battle oh wow and we got along fine yeah Nobody shot each other. I mean, it was beautiful. <laughs> and and it, 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 <laughs> for, for me, it, the, the experience of digging at Nauvoo with these marvelous volunteers from across the spectrum was a taste of Zion. Yeah. And when COVID hit, then I couldn't dig. Uh, and so we set up the, uh, the uh, Book of Mormon Perspectives Forum. And okay. we've been having that project for the last three years. Yeah, we've talked but, about but that. But now we're back to digging. Yeah, so, and I still get requests from people that are like, what is that Monday night meeting? Yeah. And so, uh, in fact, I just gave a name to Robert today, so. <laughs> well, thank you. I, we're, right now we're scheduled up into November, and I, I just find it fascinating. Rena thought that, uh, that it would die within the first year, but there's so many people that have so much to say. We've had six different presentations on where the, the land of Nephi is. Right. Isn't that fun? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and all of them so confident in their presentation, exactly. yeah. and the, the participants get to take that in and, and sort it out, ask questions, treat each other with respect, and it's just a delightful educational process. Yeah, it's super fun. And you've been there, and I thank I you for the. There. I've presented uh, a few times. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. I just volunteered for another one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I hope you enjoyed a conversation with archaeologist Paul DeBarth. In our next conversation, we're going to about find out some surprising news about the mansion house in Nauvoo. I think there's clear evidence of the Underground Railroad. So are you saying that the mansion house was part of the Underground Railroad? I'm saying that. Yeah, I haven't got that published yet, but... Holy cow! <laughs> yes, uh, I, I can show you the pictures that, of, of the excavation that demonstrate this hiding place. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, subscribe on either Patreon or at GospelTangents.com. For just $5 a month, you can hear the entire audio uninterrupted. On our $10 tier, if you'd like to see the whole video, you can see that uh, either on YouTube.com slash GospelTangents, or I've got a special Facebook group devoted for uh, full videos. So subscribe at GospelTangents.com and uh, sign up for just $10 a month. 
for twenty dollars a month, if you'd like to get some bonus content, uh, maybe some of the stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor, you can sign up for that. And then, if you'd like to talk to me for a hundred dollars a month, we'll we'll do a monthly phone call on something like Zoom, and you can ask me anything you want. So, thanks again. Also, don't forget about the merch, mugs, T-shirts, um, hats, things like that. I'm trying to get the ties up there. Hopefully I can get up, up there. And uh, thanks again for watching Gospel Tangents. And click here for some more videos.